it can be easy for those of us like myself in the healthy pet space to say things about the quality of ingredients that a lot of big pet food manufacturers use is just really poor quality. And we can certainly talk about the processes <laughs> that they use, the rendering of ingredients, the things that are allowed because it is technically feed and not food. But as a consumer, how do you quantify that? How do you actually take that information? A lot of the information that creators such as myself put out into the world and say, okay, how does this apply specifically to how I am feeding my pet? Well, that is why I was so excited to have Susan Thixton on last week's podcast episode. If you haven't listened to it yet, I highly recommend that you pause this episode, go back last to last week's episode, listen. It was episode 92 called The Truth About Pet Food with Susan Thixton. And to kind of grow that momentum and give you an idea as a consumer, specifically what we're talking about when we say, you know, AFCO is not doing a great job of regulating pet feed, which they call pet food, to understand kind of exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't had an opportunity to go to Susan Thixton's blog, which is truthaboutpetfood.com, she published a blog post recently. It was published May 5th, 2023, and it's called AFCO's New Common Food Index. Now, if you're not familiar with AFCO, and if that doesn't make sense to you yet, I get it. Stick in there with me because this is going to be an absolutely eye-opening episode. If you haven't dove in to what we're actually talking about and really gotten down into the nitty gritty of what is going on in the pet food industry, stick around. I'm gonna give you a little taste of the information that Susan Thixton does put out on her blog because it is gold when we're talking about understanding pet food and pet food regulation. <laughs> Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Welcome back. So we are going to dive into Susan Thixton from Truth About Pet Foods recent blog post about AFCO's new common food index. Who is AFCO first and foremost? Let's start there. So AFCO is the Association of American Feed Control Officials. It's a nonprofit organization and they set standards for both animal feeds and pet foods, which could be feed or food. There are some pet foods out there. A lot of them are actually pet feed in the United States. So Susan's blog starts out with a picture of two apples. One of them is a beautiful apple that you would find at the grocery store. The one next to it is completely rotten, half brown, sunken in because it is decomposing. And it says, not currently required to be disclosed because that's what common food is. So let's dive into this blog post a little bit. It says there are ingredients used in pet food that don't necessarily require a legal definition. And an apple is an example of that. Apple is a common food, a familiar food that doesn't require a legal definition. The, um, Association of American Feed Control Officials, AFCO, have released their list of approved common foods, ingredients that can be used in pet food slash animal feed without a legal definition. And there is a link where you can download the common food index. And it's not huge. It's a one-page PDF that was published uh, by AFCO in April of 2023. And it goes from apple all the way down to watermelon and a lot of stuff in between. It's a lot of, um, we're looking at fruits, vegetables, um, 
what else are on here? Mushrooms, beans, seeds, sea salt, uh, honey. So different things that when somebody says like the word peach, you understand what a peach is. That comes to mind, right? Um, interestingly, New Zealand green mussel is on here. A lot of you may not be able to pull that one up, right? That's not super common. Uh, Niger seed, I don't even know what that is. So there are some things on here to me are a little hmm, suspect, but nevertheless, I will absolutely make sure to include the link to the blog post in the show notes of this so you can get all of this information. Uh, with anything in pet food, as Susan says, it's not as simple as they would have you believe. Uh, the legal definition of common food is, and here is the legal definition, common foods are defined as food items commercially available and suitable for use in animal food but are not defined by AFCO, including but not limited to certain whole seeds, vegetables, or fruits. Common food for animals may include common human foods that are known to be safe for the intended use in animal food. Manufacturers are responsible for determining whether a common food is safe and has utility for its intended use prior to commercial distribution as animal food. So then Susan goes on to list the AFCO Common Food Index Policy Guidelines, and those guidelines state, these common foods must align with the feed term common foods in the feed terms and definitions within chapter six of the AFCO official publication. Blah, 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 blah. All boring stuff to me, probably to you too. Um, but they're basically just saying that these are officially recognized feed ingredient definitions as common foods. So just in these two quotes, uh, uh, Susan says, we have AFCO referencing these ingredients as food, animal food, and feed. So what are they? Are they feed or are they food? And the answer is that they can be either quality without disclosure to the consumer. The key for pet owners to understand ingredient quality of common index uh, foods is six little words included in AFCO's common food definition. What are those six words? Suitable for use in animal food because we understand you and i that suitable for use in animal food does not mean suitable for human food those are two very different different definitions those are two very different standards now of course something that is you know usda approved in um you know human grade food also cannot be good for some sometimes cannot be good for us right um when we think of as a matter of fact i was just speaking with someone earlier today we were talking about tripe and when you get tripe for human consumption it has been bleached but that is usda uh, stamped approved and that's literally bleached like we do not want to ingest bleach and i'm not saying that we're ingesting bleach when we eat tripe but that food has been contaminated with because it was cleaned with bleach. That's not okay, but it is USDA stamped approved, right? So it's, this isn't all one way or the other. I, that's kind of what I wanted to just interject here. This, isn't, this doesn't mean that everything approved for human consumption is the gold standard. No, it's not. We still have to do our due diligence, but a lot of things, a lot of things approved for animal feed, for animal consumption. I mean, the regulation is just, first of all, barely there. Like pretty much put whatever you want into this food. And even when there are stipulations, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying uh, we don't always regulate properly. We don't always follow up. We don't always do. And when I say we, I'm talking about government ent entities such as the FDA who actually regulates um, and controls the regulation of pet food and pet feed in the United States. So um, Susan goes on to talk about what is suitable for use in animal food. What does AFCO say 
that the, you know, the definition of feed grade and suitable for use in animal fruit food, that term was approved back in AFCO meeting minutes from 2016. So the final, let's see, the um, uh, meeting was held January 19th of 2016, and the final, final minutes were published February 8th, 2016, and the new feed terms state, material that has been determined to be safe, functional, and suitable for its intended use in animal food, is handled and labeled appropriately, and conforms with the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act unless otherwise expressly permitted by the appropriate state or federal agency suitable for use in animal feed. So what does suitable for use in animal feed? They say C, feed grade, which is what we just read. Human grade, on the other hand, the new term definition, human grade is every ingredient and the resulting product are stored, handled, processed and transported in a manner that is consistent and compliant with regulations for current food, good food manufacturing practices for human edible food as specified in something that doesn't matter to us because it is paperwork that we will never see. <laughs> uh, Susan goes on to say, please notice that the legal definition of feed grade states that ingredients conform to federal law food unless they are allow allowed not to, which is feed. Also, please notice that the legal definition of human grade has no similar wording. Ingredients are required to be human edible and only human edible. So AFCO is claiming that their new common food in index is, quote, providing transparency, but does it, Susan asks. Is it transparency when consumers and pet owners are not informed on a pet food label if the ingredient is food or feed? Is it transparency when all ingredients are labeled the same? For example, apple, when they are allowed to be dramatically different in quality. Thankfully, Susan says, we have federal law on our side. Federal law requires transparency with common food names, not allowing two different classifications of a common food to use the same name. So um, Susan goes on to list where the federal law states this and she has because as we learned in last week's episode susan is the biggest that i know of consumer advocate for uh, us consumers of pet food and pet feed and so she has provided she has put in multiple petitions with the fda to do their job basically and regulate pet food as they are supposed to. And I keep saying pet food, but it is in more than more than we'd like it to be. Almost all, most cases, pet feed. Um, and so Susan has submitted this uh, federal law showing that this this is what federal law is it is title 22 chapter 1 subchapter e part 502.5 in the general principles <laughs> um and she has submitted that to afco saying are you going to abide by this will they abide by federal law or will they ignore it susan asks time will tell pet owners are encouraged to send afco their comments Please send your comment by June 2nd, 2023, and please be respectful. You can submit your message here with a link in the blog post. So again, I will make sure all of this is linked in the show notes for today. But I wanted to, while this barely scratches the surface <laughs> of all of the regulation that, and okay, let me pause here for just a moment because you know what? Before I tell you, <laughs> what I want to tell you is a little side note, a little story, um, and we, we kind of move on with today's episode. I want to break for a moment for a word from our sponsor, and we will be right back to continue talking about how we are barely scratching the surface of regulation in pet feed and pet food. 
Today's episode is brought to you by the Furry Family Coach Dog Training. Train your dog in the comfort of your own home and on your schedule with video instruction from me. Learn the foundations of training, teach basic cues to your dog, and explore solutions to behavioral issues all inside of this video-based online training course. Go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to see you on the inside. Welcome back. So, okay, we have been talking about Susan Thixton's article on common foods. (laughs) <laughs> and how the how AFCO has determined what a common food is and that we don't have to, in pet food and pet feed, uh, we don't have to distinguish the quality of an item. It doesn't matter what the quality it is. It is all labeled as, for example, apple, because apple is considered a common food. And how, in all reality, those definitions that AFCO has presented and uh, turned into regulation for the uh, animal feed industry goes completely against uh, prior regulation for food and feed. So she has submitted paperwork to the FDA asking them if they are actually going to abide by current regulation or are they going to just ignore it and do whatever they want as they typically do, though she is much nicer about it, (laughs) I will tell you. Um, What I wanted to say, and I wanted to pause for just a moment and kind of, you know, you're here because of the perspective that I bring to these topics. And I appreciate that. And I, I want you to know how much I do appreciate you for wanting my input on these topics because I try to I try to be as level-headed as I can. I'm a pet parent first and foremost, and I love and care about your pets as well. But day to day, I'm taking care of my pets. And so that is obviously top of mind for me. And so I try to be as rational and level-headed as I can as a consumer of these products. And as a citizen of the United States, who, by the way, I absolutely love America. I am, I'm a big fan, you know, of being an American and being born here in America. That said, our governmental oversight is, I'm going to try to keep this family, family friendly. (laughs) It is BS. We have laws on top of laws, on top of regulation, on top of regulation, on top of statutes, on top of, oh my goodness gracious, all they want to do is keep writing more and more laws and regulations while they're not upholding the ones that were previously written. It's gotten out of hand. In my opinion, I am very much for small government. You know, in my opinion, we should go back to our original constitution constitutional government, you know, we have federally (laughs) um, where we have a military and we have a federal judicial system, but, you know, take your hands out of everything else and let's restructure and refigure things. I know that's a lot to ask. I'm not saying I know how to get there or how to accomplish that. What I'm saying is I'm for small government. That said, the rules and regulations, the laws, the statutes locally, um, what we have on the books in individual states and federally, we need to figure out what is there that is working, that is good, that is going to allow for healthy capitalism while providing a, a good product to the consumer at the end of the day, whatever regulation we are left with, we need to uphold it. And we need to make sure that companies are abiding by legislation and lobbying. Oh my goodness gracious. I don't want to turn this into a political show. That's not what this is. I'm not trying to get political on you. I'm just kind of giving you an idea of this isn't just hey, company, do better. 
it is so much bigger than that because pet food is a multi-billion dollar industry and everybody is just cutting cost everywhere they can to make sure their profits keep going up and up and up and up and up. That's just the way things work. A lot of that has to do with the fact that there are very few companies that own the majority of the brands. That's a problem too. That's why they get away with doing what they're doing because regardless if you switch from brand A to brand B, there's a good chance that same parent company owns it. And so they're making the money from you one way or the other. And so that in itself is where we kind of have to fix the system. That being said, <laughs> there are so many things that we can do as consumer advocates. We can help people like Susan Thixton. We can contact our local representatives. We can make our own food for our pets. That's a big one. We can source ingredients ourselves to feed ourselves and our pets. That's a pretty good one. I'd love for that to happen. Is it feasible for everybody? I understand that it isn't. But we do want to learn as much as we can so that we can make the best decisions possible, which is again, why I wanted to, to kind of expand a little bit more on the work that Susan is doing. I know I, I know I just had her on the show last week, but the work she is doing is so important that I didn't want to leave it at a standalone episode with her. I really wanted to make sure that even if you hadn't had a chance yet to check out truthaboutpetfood.com, that I brought a little bit more of that to you so that you can understand it a little bit better. And if this is something that makes sense for you, if it's easier for you to consume content the way I'm providing it to you, let me know because I can continue to handpick different blogs and articles and bring them to you in this fashion. I know for me, it is so much easier for me to listen to a podcast than to sit down and read for an hour. Like, I read something and then I get interested and then I have to go and read about something that I found interesting in the first thing that I was reading. And now I'm sitting there and I've read a few things and an hour has gone by. And meanwhile, I can listen to a podcast on one and a half speed and get so much more information in. So if that interests you, if this kind of episode interests you, uh, please do me, do me a favor, do me a solid. If you are listening on Apple or Spotify, make sure you're following the podcast. Leave a review and a rating. Hopefully it's a five-star rating, uh, but leave a review and a rating because what happens is this obviously is going to make my day because I am here for you to provide information for you to be able to make better educated decisions for your pets. That's the goal at the end of the day. But it's going to grow the show on the podcast apps, which is going to in turn allow me to get bigger and better guests on the show to bring you bigger, better information to help you learn and grow and make better educated decisions for your pets. So once you do that, I would love if you screen took a screenshot of your review and posted it on social media. Make sure to tag me on Instagram at the Pet Parenting Reset. And of course, I will, first of all, love you forever, but I will also reshare it to my stories and let you know just how much I appreciate you and share that with the world. So with that being said, I do hope that this wasn't too overwhelming. I know it can seem a little overwhelming. It's one more thing to kind of file away in the back of your mind when you are looking at ingredient labels the next time you walk into your store to purchase a product for your pet. Or maybe you order online. You can still see the ingredient labels on all of those products before you add them to your cart. And this is just one more little piece of information to help you make more informed and better decisions to care for your pet. 
With that being said, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Please give your pets some extra love from me, and I will talk to you again next week. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode, and please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, 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 oh.